Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, we are a nonpartisan 501c3 think tank. Uh, we do research and events on international affairs. And this morning we have a really special treat. Um, our newly launched Africa program is sponsoring a program and uh, we are in collaboration with the Foundation for Strategic Research, uh, which is part of University of Wit Wit Waterstrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And our guests this morning are um, actually, we have one of them in South Africa in Cape Town, one coming to us from Nigeria and another from Kenya. So um, the, the really exciting thing about this program this morning is that uh, our Africa program has been primarily uh, Americans, uh, US citizens talking about Africa. And this morning, we're having Africans talk about Africa, and they're going to be talking about uh, their view of the US-China competition in Africa, a really important topic. Um, before we get started, um, I'm going to introduce our moderator, who many of you know, Ambassador Charles Ray, who's a FPRI trustee, as well as the chair of FPRI's Africa program. Uh, he has a um, really impressive background, having served as a U.S. ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. Uh, he also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for POW Miss personnel affairs and um, he spent prior to joining the Foreign Service 20 years in the US Army with postings in Europe and Asia including two tours in Vietnam during the war uh, and I will um, momentarily turn it over to Ambassador Ray to introduce our guest this morning. But before I do, I want to flag an upcoming event for all of you. We are going to be having uh, former Ambassador Ryan Crocker on September 9th, uh, talking It's part of our Mainland Line series with uh, the host of that, John Nagel. Noggle, I think it is, and um, going to be talking about Afghanistan. Uh, ambassador Crocker was a former ambassador to, to um, Afghanistan. He was ambassador to Pakistan. He was ambassador to Iraq. I can think of no one better to talk about this situation because he not only understands Afghanistan, he understands the region and he understands how that fits into U.S. foreign policy making. So mark your calendar, September 9th. That's going to be a really special event. And I think well, we just sent out an announcement on that. And if we didn't, we're just about to. But uh, check, your, check your emails for that. Finally, uh, before I turn it over to all of you, I want to thank our members and supporters and our trustees who are on this uh, event call this morning. Thank you. Uh, if you're not yet a member, please consider becoming a member. Uh, and we always say these events are free to you, but they're not free to us. And we really do need your support to keep this going. But thank you to those of you who have already given generously. We are truly grateful. Uh, the usual housekeeping notes, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, in the chat, we'll be posting a map of South Africa and region, so you can uh, look at that um, and to familiarize yourself if you would find that useful. We'll also be making, we are making a recording of this, which will be posted usually within 24 hours if you want to view it again or share it with your friends. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Ambassador Ray. Uh, thank you, President Flynn, and welcome to all of you. Uh, this, the question or subject, I would say, of U.S.-China competition has been really at the forefront of a lot of news here in the United States for some time now. Uh, and in particular, I think among foreign policy uh, officials, the the issue of U.S.-China competition in Africa has been a big part of a lot of discussions. One of the things that has not been done, to my knowledge, uh, is to get the African viewpoint of this competition. And that's what we hope to do today. And we put together a panel. Uh, I, I don't think we could have put together a more appropriate group. Uh, we have a, a group of experts who not only are well-versed in the situation on the African continent, but each of them has, has deep ties with China. 
uh, through through their studies, and and we hope that uh, you will get a lot out of this today. I'd like to quickly introduce the panel, uh, and then we'll have them uh, give you their their presentations. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Mandira Bagwandin, who is a graduate of Fudan University in Shanghai, China. She's a research fellow for the Foundation for Strategic Research in France, and also a research fellow for the Afro. Sino Center for International Relations in Ghana. Uh, we have Beatrice Matiri Masori, who has a PhD from the University of Business and Economics in Beijing. She has 20 years of experience in international business and trade in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. And also we have Efin Inubi, Acting Director of Research and Studies uh, and of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, who also has a PhD from Jilin University in Northeast China. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Bob Wakesa, the acting director of the African Center for the Study of the US, will not be able to join us today, uh, but I think we will still have a very uh, fulsome conversation nonetheless. I'd like to start have each of the panelists uh, give a brief introduction uh, and then we will get into questions and answers uh, and i would start with ms Bakwandin, followed by ms uh, matiri masori uh, and then mr ubi um, so if you would please uh, introduce yourselves uh, and what you have to say about this topic Okay, sure. Thank you, Charlie. Um, first, I'd like to say, you know, thank you to thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me to be part of what I think is going to be a very robust and interesting introduction. Um, it's also such a great pleasure to be in the presence, albeit virtually, with distinguished individuals and um, experts. So, um, just about a bit about my research and kind of. Uh, my, my studies on China. I've, I've been studying and analyzing China and its foreign relations for a while now, about, I think, eight or so years. And I've covered Beijing's relations with Iran in the context of its energy security during my master's research. After that, I closely followed South China Sea and India-China tensions when I worked in the corporate sector as an Asia-Pacific country risk analyst. And over the last four, four years, my PhD research has focused on China-Africa relations, uh, specifically the Belt and Road Initiative and Chinese railway developments in East Africa. Um, and just to provide a few comments uh, and uh, some of my thoughts on the topic uh, of discussion today, I think um, that the, the current uh, US tensions or US-China tensions are, are playing out in a kind of Cold War-esque fashion. Um, you know, the two are at loggerheads in almost every aspect, both geopolitically and geoeconomically. Um, from trade, you know, from trade tensions to tech competition to pre pre presenting the world with different governing and development models and different transcontinental, transcontinental initiatives, you know, China's BRI, and now the US and G7's B3W. Um, in my opinion, it, it seems that the US is, it seems like the US is threatened by and trying to curtail China's global influence. Um, I think, I mean, I'm not an American citizen, so you have, you can correct me at any time you'd like, but I, I think that, you know, the US wants to reinforce its position as kind of this vanguard for economic and political liberalism. And I think this is in light of China having shown or showing the world, especially the developing world, that, a, that an alternate political economic model, one that is um, socialist, communist, state-led, and, and I'd even go far as to say mercantilist in nature, can also produce development re results. And I think now, when we look at this US-China competition with regards to Africa, I think that African states need to avoid becoming proxy battlefields or pawns as they were in the Cold War. Uh, for me, I think African countries need to be prudent in their dealings with the US and China to ensure that their development needs are, 
prioritized and their interests are put first and that they do not become embroiled in uh, geopolitical uh, tussles. Um, I also think, in my opinion, I also think uh, it's, it's an opportune time for African agency to be practiced and asserted. It's a chance for African countries not to just sit on the periphery of the, the international arena as observers, but a chance for them to actively shape and influence geopolitical balancings. You know, we're all aware, well, at least those of us, who, you know, who are familiar with, with like international history and China's history as well, are aware, um, you know, that we are aware of the power of a collective Africa in shaping international politics. I think, um, you know, you, you can look at the example of how the African bloc was used or um, kind of sided with, with China and unseating Taiwan at the UN. So now I think African states either continentally or regionally must think carefully about some type of collective strategy for navigating this, this great power rivalry on the continent. And at the same time, looking at to see how this, this rivalry can be leveraged to serve African interests. And just uh, speaking a bit more to, to China and Africa, we know, or, you know, I think China has harvested and cemented itself as this dominant player politically and economically in the continent. It has uh, developed a reputation as, as Africa's go-to development partner, treating African countries as equals, really taking a muscular approach to development you know, investing heavily in transport, energy, and logistics infrastructure, these, this type of physical infrastructure that can propel economic development on the continent. And I think for the US to compete with China in Africa, it needs to rethink its approach. Uh, I think sticking to its to kind of its guns on, you know, promoting democracy and market-led principles isn't going to get it very far. But like, don't, please, please don't misunderstand me here though. These are important and relevant principles and issues, especially for ensuring good governance, but they mean very little, in my opinion, for African citizens living in poverty who, and African countries, especially lower, lower income countries that are in need of socioeconomic development. And I think learning from China, the US could take a more flexible or hybrid approach, looking to tailor development packages and like really listen to Africans instead of kind of imposing what, what it thinks is right or trying to replicate um, its kind of economic and political principles on the continent. But I'm not saying that the Chinese approach is flawless. I, I, think, I think it has its weaknesses being, you know, being state-centric elitist and some would even go far to call it uh, self-enriching, but they do get a lot of kudos for taking the time and effort to really engage with African leaders nationally, uh, as well as regionally and continentally. Um, I think that I think today I, I've been very interested and in looking forward to this discussion because I think as the discussion unfolds today, um, we need to kind of be careful not to overly generalize Chinese or US relations and interactions with Africa. You know, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, you know, Africa has, a, has 50 plus countries, uh, 54 countries that have varying uh, relations and, and uh, degrees of engagements with, with these two powers. So it's, I, I, I really look forward to us kind of keeping uh, a to engaging critically and as well keeping kind of an open mind into in today's discussions. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you. Uh, and next, uh, Beatrice Matiri Masori. Uh, I echo our Baghdadi's uh, sentiment. Thank you so much for having me in this meeting today. And, uh, you know, when I think about this particular question, is, is a little very different uh, you know, thoughts uh, for me as, as an African. I, I wouldn't understand why there is competition you know, about Africa. 
And you know, sometimes it, it's, it's very difficult for, as an African to understand why would somebody else be you know, competing you know, or having some competition around you. And many times when I listen to this dialogue, um, I know we have the you know FOCAC and the you know the forum for China Africa uh, development and there is our agenda or China agenda or Beijing agenda about Africa which is uh, you know very well captured in 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 the FOCAC and as well we 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 have had uh, you know um, uh, U.S. Uh, Africa summits, uh, which over the last 25 years have most probably been driven uh, around, uh, um, you know, AGOA uh, agreement uh, uh, for growth in Africa. But always people ask, what is what is then the agenda for? What is the Africa's agenda for? for itself uh, in the middle of all this. And I always, when I talk about this topic, I just really want to echo the Agenda 2063, which is the mm -hmm. Africa's agenda for the Africa we want. And uh, crafted in 2015, very elaborate in terms of, you know, um, the need for growth and sustainable development and the focus areas that Africa aspires to focus on health, education and, you know, science, technology and innovation, the blue economy, but also the need for an integrated continent, connectivity, uh, issues around infrastructure, financial institutions and, uh, you know, the idea around Pan-Africanism but also issues around governance and democracy, peace and security, which is uh, you know, a big area that USA over the years has focused on in Africa. But as well, the, the document and, and the, 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 the spirit of the Agenda 2063 brings it to the attention that um, it is about an Africa whose development is Africa people dr driven which is relying on the potential of the African people, especially the women and the youth. But as well, um, Aspiration 7 puts it very clearly that it's really about a strong united Africa, which is an influential global partner. Now, when I read all this, I, I really see a spirit of Africa about itself, the aspirations for what Africa wants for, for herself or for, 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 for its people. Um, and reading through this, there is, of course, a uh, very clear indication that there is need for, you know, large scale um, infrastructural connectivity and, you know, rapid transformation uh, from now, 2020, 2021, when we are talking to 2063. And this, uh, of course, there will be need in terms of uh, growth in the transport information sectors, energy sectors, water sectors, but most important is really the industrial aspects, industrialization of, you know, the African continent and the growth of, um, you know, regional value chains across East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, uh, um, maybe related or, you know, borrowing into the complementarities between the 54 African countries. But also a very major part uh, of this vision and this aspiration for Africa is growth of urban cities and, um, uh, you know, industrial zones around those particular urban cities, but as well the need for market connectivities, market linkages. Um, so when I think about, uh, you know, the opportunity that Africa stands with China or the Africa, the opportunities that Africa stands with uh, USA, for me, I see developmental partners and developmental partners that are needful, um, not one excluding the other. Because if you look into the kind of uh, programs and the kind of uh, projects and the kind of uh, areas um, identified by the Agenda 2063, that each of these developmental partner has focused on is very complementary in nature. Um, 
Over the years, uh, USA has focused on peace and security, uh, building the peace and security architecture in, you know, in the African countries, but also the health sectors are ensuring that there is capacity building uh, within the PEFA and, uh, you know, the preparedness, you know, for African uh, uh, health uh, logistics and, and networks comes China and China really the main focus is on infrastructural connectivity, from roads, railways, um, bridges, and, and name it all buildings across uh, uh, you know the, the continent. So in my view, each of these partner is needful in Africa. Their work is very um, complementarity. And for me as an African, when I actually look at this relationship, I, I don't see it as a competition. I actually see opportunities for the African people in terms of uh, opportunities to be able to scale up financial flows that will build the Africa's future. Um, and there is opportunity for all these developmental partners then to partner and to work with Africa um, to come up with new uh, models and new ways of financing for development that drive impact and scale across uh, the varied African countries, 54 African countries. As well, I see markets, um, you know, markets not only for raw products from uh, African countries, as we have seen in the past. Um, if we look at Agoa, there has been development of in, in terms of the value addition and the industrialization promotion that has been encouraged over the, uh, the last 20, 20, 20 or so years. But of course, different African countries benefit at different uh, levels. Um, and I think for the AGOA, the Agreement for Growth uh, Opportunity Act with uh, African countries and the US, then we can say most probably the Eastern African countries, uh, especially on the textile industries have benefited more, more um, as well as maybe South Africa with the motor vehicle um, industry. Um, China within the FOCAC has also um, encouraged quite a lot of, you know, industrial support, um, industrial growth. And uh, increasingly, we're seeing a focus uh, on promotion of not just uh, raw products, but more value added exports into, into China. So for me, I see opportunity for markets, you know, markets for value added uh, products. Um, I see markets uh, for the growth uh, or the output of the industrial capacity or the infrastructure or, or the manufacturing that will go on in Africa. Uh, beyond that, I see opportunity for more people to people relationship. Over the years, there's been more government to government um, interaction, but I see opportunity for more private sector NGOs, civil societies to, you know, to engage more for sustainable development and sustainable growth in Africa. I also see opportunities for, you know, um, innovation in mutual green growth and sustainability areas around renewable energy, environmental protection. And um, at this particular point in time, when we, we are in COVID, it, it's been reminded to all of us, I mean, COVID strikes wherever it, it, it is all of us that are affected. So I see opportunities for health uh, and pharma uh, industries, um, uh, opportunities around digital technology and the service sectors. Um, so what am I wanting to say? It is viewed as competition elsewhere, but for us as African, I think it, it's really, we are echoing our aspiration seven of the agenda 2063. Africa, a strong, united, resilient, and influential global player and partner. So what is very important for us as Africans then is that we, our developmental partners will give us room to define our developmental path, but also to be able to choose our partnership, those partnerships that um, uh, befit us. It, as a matter of fact, for me, I, I don't think at this particular point in time, we really need to be talking about two major developmental partners, because if you look at uh, African growth and, uh, you know, African future, um, there has been, you know, in terms of trade, Africa has traded across board with USA, with China, 
with European countries. And as for, especially for us in the East Africa, where I come from, Nairobi, with India, Turkey, Russia. So there is diversity in terms of developmental partners that we look, uh, we look at. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, most African, East African nations are really looking into the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy. What opportunities lie uh, in terms of market and in terms of openness and addressing um, and being connected through the Belt and Road Initiatives to the 4.3 billion people that live around the Indo-Pacific industry. And of course, this then, um, uh, helps us to be able to address issues around the terrorist threats around the Indian Ocean, but also promote more stability across the Indo-Pacific region of which East Africa really um, stands as a gateway, you know, for Africa to the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region. But of course, this also presents more opportunities for um, freer and, uh, you know, fair trade, but also opportunities for energy linkages. So, in totality, I don't see the competition. I honestly see more opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, very well said. Uh, FM Ubi. Your introduction, sir. Uh, first of all, um, let me thank uh, the distinguished uh, scholars here and participants and, um, for the opportunity. Uh, presented to air my views as an African on um, China and US in Africa. Um, you know, I, like uh, Beatrice said, you know, what comes to mind is, you know, anytime they talk about China, US in Africa, you know, everything that comes around is competition. Why the competition? You know, why not cooperation? And the question is competition over what? That's what I keep asking. Well, what are they competing for? Is it the resources, both natural and human? Or is it uh, over the control of the continent as a whole? You know, this whole discourse about rivalry, about competition takes us back to 1885, you know, um, during the scramble for Africa. It reminds me of the scramble for Africa where the Europeans and Start at the Berlin Conference and start partitioning Africa with pen and paper and all that. I think that's exactly a replica of what this whole discourse about rivalry and competition is all about. Now, the discourses of rivalry and competition of this nature tribalizes Africa. That's how I think about it. It tribalizes Africa and its, and its most fundamental problems, you know, which are a quagmire of uh, underdevelopment which uh, Beatrice has also listed some uh, lack of development, stagnated development, insecurity everywhere. You know, now I think had the way I see it, you know, if this competition wasn't there, I think the two countries or other superpowers would come together, you know, in a concerted effort to see how they could, you know, remedy some of these situations that are actually uh, uh, destroying the, the continent, you know. I think uh, it is high time for me that uh, the whole discourse is about competition, about rivalry should be changed to cooperation, you know, in order to build up the, the kind of Africa that we are looking for. And in any case, I don't see any reason why that competition should persist or why that rivalry should persist. And like um, some of us speakers have said, I think for me, you know, uh, I see opportunity it then gives Africa actually a leverage. Now it gives us an option. You know, prior to the advent of uh, the rise of China, I think we never had options. We just had to relate with uh, the West and um, the uh, uh, Europeans and the and, and Americans. You know, and but right now we have an option. We could decide to either relate with the United States or we, we can decide to relate with uh, uh, Ch uh, China or we could decide to relate with other powers. You know, that be now. Don't forget that, you see, this competition is not just about China and the US. Other powers too are competing. Much recently, Russia has come up with the Russia-Africa Summit. What for? I wrote an article uh, some few months ago, which is titled One Continent, One Country. 
in that in that in that in that kind of situation, I it, it undermines Africa, where a 54 countries of a continent will visit just one country, and you know, you know, it, it doesn't make no sense to me. I'm sorry, maybe don't I, please um, don't mind my language. I, I, I don't mean no harm. You know, it doesn't make any sense that a country will call 54 countries to come visit and have a discussion with them. Now, there's an agenda already set. There's an agenda that they have decided on what to do for Africa and how Africa should be governed. Now, uh, what should happen to Africa? You know, this is not right, you know. And same thing with other powers. Japan, the TCAT is there, TCAT is there. India, too, is doing the same thing. Like I argued in that article, someday Brazil will also call Africa for a meeting because these are all emerging powers, you know, and they are trying to compete over Africa, taking us back to the days of colonialism. Um, for me, I think it is not right. What is right is that, you see, this competition should become cooperation. The, you know, if you look at some uh, discourses that have, all, that have already been going on in um, China, uh, Africa discourse and uh, other places. You see, there's this what we call the trilateral dialogue. You see, in that kind, in that kind of situation, it pays more. You know, when you when there's a trilateral dialogue, or when there's either it could be beyond three countries, say U.S., EU, um, U.K., other Western countries, Africa, China, India come together and now see how they can manage the kind of crisis that Africa is in. Our problem is not the competition. Our problem is how we can leverage on whatever, uh, 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 leverage on the powers that are actually coming into Africa to, that, that will lay the foundation for Africa's development, that will help us solve our uh, uh, perennial problems like insecurity. You look at the whole of Sahel, the whole of Sahel is already ridden with insecurity. Uh, there's, there's a total collapse within that region. West Africa, same thing. If you move beyond that, other parts of Africa are also having the same problem. Now, why not turn this supposed competition in, I mean, into cooperation and see how you could remedy these problems? Now, take for instance, when uh, I'm going to use my country as a case study, at the, at the, at the, at the uh, embryonic stage of uh, insecurity, terrorism, we ask for weapons from some of, the, some, some of the countries from the West. They refused to sell weapons to us. We didn't have access to weapons and we couldn't do nothing. We, the only country we had to resort to and that was willing to sell weapons to us was China. It, it was a welcome idea for a lot of uh, Nigerians, a lot of Africans, you know, because you know, China was willing to sell these weapons. I think for me, um, 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 our relationship with the powers should be genuine. When a relationship is genuine, I think it is not about their selfish interests. It's not about uh, their innate interests. It's about the interests or their interests and the interests of Africa. What does Africa need in your relationship with Africa as you engage Africa? What do you want to engage Africa on? You know, now Africa, like I said, for me, you know, since it is a point, this, the, the, this kind of rivalry, this kind of competition, however it is called, it, it, it's a time for Africa to leverage on our relationship with the US, leverage on our relationship with China, leverage on our relationship with other powers in Africa. You know, it is high time for Africa to re-strategize its engagement with most of these countries, especially the Chinese and the US. Yeah, um, um, I would say that uh, from my viewpoint, I, you know, uh, I'll use, let me use the, the, uh, uh, a, a concept in international relations. China, I think a, a lot of Africans, you know, uh, are beginning to see China as a lesser evil, you know, because China is willing to invest where a lot of countries from the West are refusing to invest, especially in infrastructure like she has listed. And, you know, over the years, uh, for the past 10 years, I've been working on China, Africa, China, Nigeria. I've gone, I've gone in and out of uh, uh, China, uh, a lot of times, you know, to do studies, and I've gone to uh, some parts of Africa, like Mombasa, uh, Mombasa in Kenya, to study the the Mombasa uh, rail line that the Chinese are building. You could see this physical infrastructure, and the argument has always been over the 150 years that the West has been in Africa. What is there to show? 
the only thing you see, you know, um, what a whole lot of Africans are saying is that you see the rail lines that you see even in Africa that was built by the West by um, uh, at, at, the, at the period of colonialism were from the areas of raw materials to the seaports. But now you see we are we are seeing advanced uh, uh, rail rail lines across Africa. Recently, we just launched some uh, about uh, we launched uh, uh, one of our rail stations. You know, uh, I think we, this year alone we have launched about uh, commissioned about two. Sorry, we commissioned about two and all that, and they were all built by the Chinese. I think it is high time, you know, that uh, America, the Chinese, and other powers in Africa move away from this su supposed core rivalry, supposed core competition, and leverage on their position to see that Africa develop, to see that Africa's problem is remedied. You know, the problem of insecurity, lack of underdevelopment, uh, lack of development, underdevelopment, stagnated development. Across Africa, there, there are a whole lot of crises. And this rivalry is actually not healthy for Africa because it is not actually giving Africa, uh, it is not actually helping Africa, it is not putting Africa in a position to, to act, actually, you know, uh, 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 engage properly because, you know, um, um, if, for instance, let's put it this way. Let's uh, let me let me put uh, let me bring this point. You know, I want us to understand that. You see, the way U.S. engages Africa, it engages Africa. It has more engagement with what it called partners, but that is different from the Chinese. Chinese engage the 54 countries, irrespective of where you belong, whether you are you're, 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 you're a democracy, whether you're uh, a communist, whether you're an anarchist, Chinese relate with all of them equally and decides, you know, and, and negotiate with you. But you see, in, the Americans don't really do that. They have, they have core partners they relate with. And, you know, now they decide who their partners are. And I think that should, there should be a shift of a, that kind of engagement. I think they should, they should begin to engage Africa you know, all the 54 uh, countries of Africa equally and not pick partners. You know, why? Now, the question is why pick partners? Why? Why pick partners? And if you now, now you're picking these partners and the Chinese are engaging 54 countries and you now call it a lot of uh, uh, media houses, everybody's calling it a rivalry. I don't think there's any rivalry. It, I think the, the rivalry can become productive if it turns out to be cooperating to see that Africa's problems are solved and resolved, you know, and much more importantly, I think for Africa, uh, like I said, we must re-strategize our engagement. I think Africa should begin to think of a policy of engagement with every country. Uh, there, there are a lot of countries in Africa. I don't think they have policy of engagement just the same way the U.S. have U.S. Africa's policy. China has China Africa policy, which is under focus, you know. I don't think most countries in Africa have a policy of engagement with these major countries. I think Africa should begin to do that. Now, the two powers must understand that Africa cannot develop by aid, irrespective of how much aid China gives to Africa, how much aid the United States gives to Africa. Africa might not develop based on aid. I think development in Africa should, is, is in what? I think it, it should be African solution to Af Africa's problem and not China's solutions to Africa's problem and not US solutions to Africa's problem. And neither can it be any power solution to Africa's problem. The problem of Africa is Africa and Africa must begin to think. Africa must begin to now decide where to begin with, how to sort out these problems. And until we begin to do that, then until we begin to do that, we will never move away from where we are. I wrote, you know, in the past couple of uh, months, I talk about the gloom in boom in Africa. The past two decades, Africa, they said Africa was growing. There was Africa's economic renaissance, but that was that was a myth. That was the, the, nothing like that existed. You see, because it's economic stat, uh, statistics is never development. You could grow at seven uh, points GDP. You could grow at five percent GDP. But if it does not translate into human development, that is not development. And we have been made over the years to understand that once your statistics start growing, then you're developing. No, I think this is totally wrong. I think we also begin to unravel this myth. Africa themselves we should begin to unravel this myth. And then I think the last point I want to hit on is 
you know, um, I was in a, a meeting sometimes in a DC, and um, it was about the Millennium De Development Challenge, you know, uh, aid, you know, and there were listing countries that were eligible to get this uh, uh, aid. And a lot of countries were not eligible. And I asked them in that meeting, who created this criteria? Who gave this, who brought out this criteria? And they said the criteria came from different organizations like Amnesty, Human Rights Watch and all that. And I said, no, you cannot decide to tell us that we are not doing well in the particular, we should be the ones you know, to tell you whether we are doing well or not, and not you deciding to tell us. But the Chinese, you see, they don't even think about these conditions. They don't give conditionalities to assess money, uh, aid anyway. They don't give that conditions, but they give you economic conditions, which is right for me. I, think, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But you see, when you start trying to use conditions like uh, the, the system of government, the type of government you should run, you know, it, it actually, it actually uh, destroys you know, uh, the, the society in, in, in a way that you know, uh, uh, um, 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 it will, it will, you know, the leaders are actually the ones, you know, the, the, the populace are the ones suffering because when you place sanctions and these sanctions, the, the populace are the ones suffering, the masses, because the leaders don't suffer. I think uh, we should begin to re-strategize even development uh, uh, agendas for uh, the developing world generally, you know. Like I said, and I've argued, democracy is not a one size fits all. You see, I think it is high time we try to adapt and adopt, you know, a system that actually works for Africa. I think in that right, I think we'll begin to achieve something. And in, in, uh, in, in, in finality, I will say that we're irrespective of the rivalry or competition, I think Africa should begin to maximize, you know, their relationship with any of these powers, whether it is the US or whether it is China, you know, to leverage on their economic growth and development. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to all three of you for giving us some very, very good food for thought. Uh, before we move into the audience q and I'd, I'd like to first uh, ask uh, audience members who've been putting your questions in the chat box, please put them in the Q&A so that our Q&A moderator can, can get to them easily. Uh, I, I would like, though, before we go to the audience to, to ask a, a question, um, I, and I hope this is not provocative, uh, but it is one that, that has been discussed in some forums that I've attended here in the U.S., and that is, uh, given the, the predatory lending practices and lack of transparency of the Chinese and, and the potential impact on the economies of the countries uh, that they make these loans to. Uh, is there anything that, that you think or any role that the U.S. can play in helping the countries of Africa uh, leverage this, this lending from China in ways that are beneficial, or should we even be involved? And I'd like to first go to you, Beatrice, uh, with your business experience and get your views on that. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, the predatory lending, like you called it. Um, I mean, this, this is a dialogue and this is a conversation you pick on the media from time to time. Well, there could be, um, you know, the truth about it, but there could also be the untruth, you know, uh, about these uh, conversations. And I think, um, like we said, um, some of the dialogue is really around the competition as we, as, as we are calling it. Um, it is true that our African countries are in need of, of financing. As a matter of fact, in uh, 2018, um, AFDB did, African Development Bank did a research and uh, they said that uh, by that time, the infrastructural development or development in Africa would have required about 200 billion US dollars, and uh, there was a gap of about um, 68 to 108 uh, uh, billion dollars. So it means that definitely Africa has to borrow from somewhere to, to, um, to develop. Um, the question is where? Now, historically speaking, Africa has, you know, over the years been borrowing from the IMF and uh, from the World Bank. And uh, if we would also say predatory, I think that has also been predatory in a way because many times 
I mean, you know, I know Kenya will borrow, but I may never know where that money as well goes into, right? So over the years, each of the African countries has maintained, you know, um, uh, debt uh, burden over the years. And sometimes you may actually not know where this money has gone into. Um, so I, I pick on uh, uh, Dr. Ubi's uh, comment when he said, when we have China financing and you can actually see the infrastructural development and the changing terrain in the African countries, then you can actually attest to the connectivity from one African country to the other. And you can actually see the developing industrial terrain in the countries. Then myself as an African, I am really lost to say, why is this predatory? Why is this viewed as predatory? So in this case, um, I, I, I think there is quite a lot of, uh, you know, maybe politics or, uh, in this kind of conversation. But of course, over the years, uh, uh, many African countries are also um, are getting to the limit of their, you know, the debt burden. So there is uh, definitely need for alternative and more innovative, you know, financing uh, models. Uh, for each of the African countries. Well, some of the governments and some of the uh, countries have gone to what we call um, uh, pub public-private uh, partnerships uh, to allow uh, private investors you know, to, to finance uh, what otherwise would have been financed by the government. There has been you know, conversations mm. also around the use of um, um, sovereign wealth funds in terms of financing, which is uh, you know, for foreign uh, reserves that African countries have somewhere else. Uh, but just really to say, uh, bottom line, I think uh, what uh, the conversation is really very important is in terms of what projects are really, really necessary? What are those projects that give maximal impact in terms of their nature? Um, Dr. Ubi, uh, there earlier talks about, you know, the Mombasa, Nairobi uh, uh, Express uh, Railway um, that was intended to open up not just Kenya, but open up, uh, um, you know, uh, parts of Uganda. As well in Kenya, we have what we call the Lapset, Lamu, or uh, uh, Lapset Corridor, which is uh, expected to open up not just Kenya, but parts of uh, you know, Southern Sudan, um, um, Ethiopia, as well as you know, the DRC. So these kinds of large scale projects that have got maximal impact in terms of the number of countries that they, they, they connect, but also in terms of the um, number of people that they can bring out of poverty is really the kind of, you know, um, decisions that I, I think maybe our developmental partners should be helping us, you know, put into dialogue. What is helpful in terms of open up, opening up the entire Africa? As we look into African continental free trade area, um, there is their need to actually open up most uh, African countries. And... Um, um, I mean, I've had opportunity to travel around uh, African countries. Sometimes it is really, it is more expensive for me to move from my country, Kenya, and go to maybe DRC or Congo, Brazzaville. Uh, it's more expensive than it would cost me maybe to go to Beijing or to, the, uh, to fly to London. So in this case, there is their need to, uh, for large scale kind of projects that have got maximum impact and maximum returns, um, that uh, will drive more sustainability in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ephraim, your, uh, your comments on that question, please. You're, you're muted. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I think um, um, I, uh, recently, again, you know, we, we had a problem. I, I, I think my country, as a case study, we had a problem much recently, last year, you know, uh, that we were borrowing too much from China, and um, uh, our China is actually going to uh, take our so sovereignty. We give our sort of sovereignty to China, and I came. I, I had to write on it, and but you see, when I was doing my analysis, when I was doing my research, I found out that Africa owe more more to the West. They owe more to the West 
and their financial institutions that they owe that they owe to China. For instance, we are owing about 20 something billion dollars, but we owe China only three billion dollars. I'm using my country as a case study. So in that right, you see, why is why was there the whole media uh, hype about the debt trap? There's no, there's no debt trap anywhere, you know. And you know, like I argued, why will you say uh, we are we are subletting our sovereignty to China in the 21st century? How can a country like this sublet its sovereignty? You know. Meanwhile, it's just a particular clause in the, in, the, in, the, in the loan agreement that when you refuse to pay, don't come, up, don't come up with sovereign immunity when you go to court over that. You know, that was what it is, you know. Um, I don't think, I think um, for me, you know, uh, loans are supposed to be used for the purpose for which it is spent for. You know, in the, in the 70s, in the 80s, when we're talking about aid fatigue, you know, uh, it was because the money that was collected were not used for the purpose for which that money was meant for. Instead, the regimes were using it to pay the boys as usual, to keep themselves in power. Now, if you collect money for infrastructure, for God's sake, you have to build that infrastructure. You have to develop that infrastructure, you know? And you see, what, what we need much more now is building infrastructure because without infrastructure, the economy can't grow. We need that connectivity. We need air connectivity, which uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Messori has talked about. We need uh, uh, waterways. We need the, the, the roads, you know? And if we, except we have those, 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 those infrastructure, productive infrastructure, Africa can't move anywhere. And, you know, building Africa's infrastructure is very expensive and we need money. The most countries in Africa don't have the financial where we are. They are financially incapacitated and you don't expect us. If, you know, China is giving you two to 3% interest, uh, interest. When you go to IMF and World Bank, the interest is higher. You know, you see, it's, you know, it normally is business. I see it as business. You go to where it's cheap. So if it's cheaper there, then you now go. I think, um, although uh, I, 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 I quite agree with some of the argument that has been put forward, not, you know, not from the panelists right now, but from other discourses, you know, about the fact that China is not part of uh, the dark countries, you know, it doesn't take into consideration a whole lot of measures, you know, that uh, uh, should be taken into consideration for giving, before giving out loans. But I think, you know, irrespective of how this money comes, for me, it is not how the money comes or where the money is coming from, but how the money is channeled. Is the money channeled into the proper reasons for which the money is collected? If you're collecting money for railways, build railways. If you're collecting for roads, build the roads. You know, let, let, we need to see this physical infrastructure. And for, and, and for uh, uh, the, the truth is that we are seeing them. You know, China is actually building these things. We are seeing them, you know. Um, I think there should be complementarity, you know, in, within these powers. If China is doing one of these, then other countries should be doing this, you know, and not to rival and going to the media, you know, and say uh, that trap, you know. You, you, I, I think the, 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 this last one year has shown that the social media could destroy a whole lot of things because there's so much disinformation, there's so much misinformation, and there's totally lack of information, especially from a lot of government. And that is why, you know, you could see a whole lot of information that is going out there that is not true. You know, I, I you know, I, I'm happy. Um, uh, I, I, there's a study that was carried out, of, I think, uh, 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 Carry or so something, that where they now talk among the Sri Lanka case, you know, which was the one that was stated. But, you know, uh, if you look at the FOCAC agreement, if you have studied uh, the FOCAC uh, plan of action and their agreement over the years, you know, you could see where they talk, of, or talk about bill, operate and transfer. It is there. So sometimes uh, um, I think it is lack of understanding. And I want to clearly state this here, which I have done. And I did because my, pro, my, my PhD dissertation was on infrastructural development. Chinese infrastructural development it comes in three kinds. There is gratis. Gratis is basically for social infrastructures like presidential palaces, 
stadiums, cultural centers. Now, there's also one that comes in percentage form. That means the, reci the recipient country is willing to bring a percentage of that money they want to get from China. China is going to bring 70%, for instance, the recipient country will bring 30%. And in many cases, those, that 30% is not in, in, in cash, but in other, uh, 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 either that money is in uh, housing, administration, and all that, you know. Now, the third one is, is the one that is wholly funded by the Chinese government or the Chinese company. But I want to say one thing here which again will give us a clear understanding of how the Chinese operate. You see, when it is in percentage form, if many countries have not been able to pay that, their own part uh, of the obligations. For instance, it is 30%, they don't bring. Now, they, those Chinese companies will have to go and source for funding. Those Chinese companies will have to go and source for funding and now make up to complete that project. Now, I remember there's a country, a particular country, when that where, where, where that happened, and what happened was, the Chinese the the government had to give that infrastructure to the Chinese the consortium of Chinese companies to run for a period of time until they recoup back their money. So, will you say that is China? Will you say that Chinese sees that 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 infrastructure? No, I think we should begin to understand. I think part of the problem we have here is the lack of understanding of the Chinese relationship with Africa. You know, we spent a whole lot of time understanding, reading about the West relationship, but not looking in depth into how China operates and relates with African countries. And I think from what I have seen, they too have also been studying. I think, yeah, the rivalry is ongoing anyway, in, 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 a, in a pseudo sense. They have been studying each other and knowing the fault lines of each of them. Now, this one tried to leverage on the other in terms of relationship. But the question is, this, this rivalry, to what end is it for Africa? That is the question we should be asking ourselves. If what is Africa gaining from this rivalry? In any case, I think for me, the best, like I have said, is for these powers to come together to see that Africa moves from where it is right now. And we'll keep borrowing as long as we don't have money to run the economy. We keep borrowing for infrastructure. Africa needs about more than a trillion dollar annually to build its infrastructure. Uh, my former uh, Minister of uh, uh, Finance and, and uh, Coordinating Minister of Economics say we need a billion, $100 billion annually to build our infrastructure. Nigeria does not even have that kind of money. So we have to rely from donors. We have to rely, uh, uh, rely on aid from, our, from outside the country, you know to be able to get this done. And you see, we are willing, like it is always said, capital fly to where it is needed. So we are willing to fly to where we can get this money, you know, to upgrade and build our infrastructure and build a robust economy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank all three of you. I, I, could, I could ask questions for the rest of the session, uh, but I, I see we have quite a few questions in our Q&A box and so, uh, I will I will turn it over to our president, Raleigh Flynn, to moderate that. Before I do, I would like to remind all of the audience, would you please put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box? Uh, and thank you. President Flynn, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Ray. And thank you to, to our panelists for a really fascinating discussion, which has obviously prompted a great many questions we have. 17 in the Q&A and a bunch more in the chat. So, so thank you all for those. Uh, I was also remiss in my introductory remarks and not saying more about the African Center for the Study of the United States, uh, which with whom we are partnering today. Uh, this is part of the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, one of the top universities in all of Africa and in all of the world, I might add. And this is a center that was launched in March 2018. And um, it's the first of its kind on the African 
continent to really uh, analyze uh, the United States and, um, and sort of redress, as they say, the imbalance in the knowledge flow between the US and Africa. We are really honored to be, to be partnering with them on this program this morning and hope it is the start of many more because clearly we are not going to be able to get to all those questions that are in the chat and in the Q&A box. Uh, but um, one of them that I find very interesting is um, uh, that came in early in, in the conversation. It, it mentions that China's been very visible in Africa's trade and infrastructure modernization front. And the US, on the other hand, where China has focused on trade and infrastructure, the US has focused on Africa's security and social transformation. And the questioner says, Africa needs both of these. Um, it's not, shouldn't be an either or, but the question is, how would uh, our panelists assess the relative needs of those? And um, I don't know who wants to go first, but, but maybe Mandira, would you be interested in taking that on? We can't hear you. Uh, yes, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of, you can definitely expect a Chinese kind of engagements in Africa and kind of the, the kind of visible engagement is the infrastructure. And then on the other hand, we have the US involved in peace and mostly in peace and security and more like uh, social, social issues such as healthcare and education. Um, and I definitely think that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, now the US needs to go into infrastructure. I mean, Africans need to kind of, and they are doing, as we've seen with Agenda 2063 and very regional, regional plans, looking at, you know, okay, we need infrastructure. China is generally our go-to development partner for these things. You know, if we, we go to the US and, they can't, we'll go to China. It's, it's just about having your options open and going for the best option. And I think that, you know, we don't, you don't necessarily have to stick to one partner. We now are also seeing that China is getting, you know, its security footprint, peace and security footprint has grown in Africa. It's, it's involved in um, UN peacekeeping operations as well. Um, so it's, in my opinion, it's, you don't have to, to like, stick choose choose one person to supply or one sorry one country or one development partner to to meet all your your needs it's more about you know having a, a variety of players in the game and looking at which offers you the best um kind of solutions and uh packages to to kind of uh, meet the country's needs uh thank you uh beatrice or Evan, would either of you like to comment on that yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, in my view, this is very complementary in nature. Um, yeah. China focusing on trade and infrastructure means that there is openness, there is connectivity, there is opportunity to precipitate more industrialization and that goods from one market can be able to move from one place to the other. But you realize also in Africa, there is, you know, quite a lot of, you know, social needs. Um, you know, when we talk about the health infrastructure, when we talk about, you know, governance issues, when we talk about the nature of the institutions, and, and this is where the US government has also focused on. Now, when you talk about trade, it is mainly the private sector that is actually doing trade, um, that is moving goods from one or generating the goods. But in terms of how that impacts on, you know, the social frameworks, um, the poverty index, and, you know, the, the, the ability of, you know, um, people to respond to issues like education and health, then we have more, you know, civil societies and NGOs that are focused on this area. In my presentation area, I said there is really more need to drive away from just a government-led, you know, dialogue and uh, engagement, uh, both from the China side and from the U.S. side, to incorporate more, 
you know, that uh, uh, arrangement between private sector and the CSOs, uh, uh, civil society organizations and the NGOs, because each one of them has got different um, capability, different ability, and it is needful that all of them can be able to work together for sustainability. Now, if we talked about just, uh, you, you know, financing and borrowing loan, uh, loans, the way those loans are used to be able to drive maximum impact needs quite a lot of expertise from maybe the NGOs, um, the civil society organizations, which uh, in my view, you know, China does not focus on this particular area. So in that way, I, I believe that the participation or, or the contribution that you know China and US are bringing to Africa is very complementary in nature, but really relies on us as Africans to be able to uh, tap into that expertise, to tap into that uh, opportunity, to ensure that there is maximal impact in terms of when an infrastructure is being built, what is the labor uh, how does it translate to labor for the African people? How does it uh, translate to, you know, industrialization? How do the, you know, institutional frameworks work together to ensure that this can translate to more education and more health uh, readiness or, or uh, impact for, for our people? So there is quite some capability needed in terms of um, ensuring that that complementarity uh, works. Thank you. Thank you. Ethan, do you have anything to add to that? We, we can't hear you once again. Sorry, I, I'm muted. I muted myself. So um, I think um, uh, I quite agree with the, a whole lot of positions actually uh, put forward here. And um, uh, like like you rightly said, you know the U.S. has been doing so much in terms of security in Africa, and um, you see China doing a whole lot more on uh, from the economic uh, 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 sector, and um, you know, uh, but you know, I, I you know I have a little bit uh, a, a little problem with the Chinese uh, approach to security, and uh, which is you know that is one aspect that the Chinese are supposed to. Uh, work on. For instance, um, you know, I think uh, if you have access to one of my uh, uh, publications on uh, China's role in Africa's uh, peace and security, you know, examining the role of China in uh, Nigeria's security, you find out that the Chinese, you know, uh, when it comes to issues of security, they relate from, they relate within a multilateral arrangement. But when it comes to issues that have to do with trade, you know, economics, you know, it is bilateral. And in any case, you see, they don't really want to get involved in, 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 in on issues of security because they think, you know, it's going to undermine their, 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 their policy of interference, you know, and intervention, you know, by which is which in any case, you could see them, you know, uh, continue to do business in, uh, 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 even in war-torn countries, you know, and they don't even mind, you know, I think that's one approach that they, they actually need to change, which is different from the way the United States operates, you know, and, uh, and they are doing a whole lot in that, in that, in that, in that sector in terms of security, uh, helping to uh, mitigate uh, terrorism and a whole lot of uh, 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 insurgency that's ongoing not just in Africa, you know, but across the world. And I think that's an, an, approach, an, an aspect that the Chinese, the Chinese need to change. You know, it's not about building a, a military bases like they are, they are doing in uh, Djibouti. And uh, most, most recently, they are also trying to, there was, uh, I raised it, which uh, another one they're trying to negotiate to build at the Gulf of Guinea, you know, and all that. I think these are, uh, which I don't know what for, but according to them is to protect the sea lane and all that. But that is, it goes beyond protecting the sea lane. It goes beyond protecting the sea lane. It, 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 security is very holistic. It's not just uh, an aspect and all that. I think that is an aspect that the Chinese have to change. But much more importantly, um, the United States should begin to engage Africa from a different standpoint, from a different perspective. Like I said, they shouldn't be on a partnership basis. They should go beyond that. And in terms of uh, uh, foreign aid, I think um, 
the, 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 I think most of the criteria that has been put forward should be lessened because I think Africa needs development. Africa needs, you know, development needs to trickle down to the people. I think this is what should actually determine our engagement, yeah, US engagement with Africa. That is also what should determine even Chinese engagement with Africa. That is what should determine any other power engagement with Africa. You see, the whole idea of engagement, you know, is to make sure that every country, you know, there's equity, there's equality, there's parity, you know, you know, at not uh, the asymmetric kind of relationship that we, we, we that subsists, that uh, sub, subsists uh, right now. And uh, importantly, too, I think I would like to say that, you know, you see, this whole idea of rivalry and competition that we are talking about, you know, it, it still boils down to resources. Now, what is Africa selling to all these powers? It's just commodities. We are not we are commodities. And that's why when you talk about trade balance, Africa, there's no trade balance. There can never be a trade balance when Africa is only going to be selling commodities to the United States, selling commodities to Chinese. We need to move beyond commodities. We need to go into industrialization. We need to start manufacturing. You know, I think we should have value addition to our goods and all that. I think that's the only way that we will begin to enjoy our relationship with the powers that be in Africa, irrespective of uh, their, their, their distinguished disposition. I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great discussion. Um, I'm going to, uh, we have, a, we just have so many great questions and we, we're going to have to have a part two, maybe a part three and part four of this. But uh, one of them I think is really, really interesting and important. And it, uh, it's a comment and a question. Uh, often the racist tensions that have accompanied Chinese investments in Africa, like in Zambia, are swept under the carpet when discuss discussing the China-Africa relationship why Chinese and not other foreign investments. And I'd also add to this um, the, the, um, what some would consider the issue of Chinese immigration that follows in the wake of these, uh, of these, uh, these um, Chinese projects. Um, but I'd also, uh, the questioner didn't ask this, I would add an addendum to this question, which is, have there been racist tensions associated with US projects and, and programs in Africa as well. I don't wanna just focus on, on China, but also on the United States. So um, Effin, perhaps you'd like to start us on this one in case I just lobbed a, a grenade into the conversation. Effin. Effin, you're hear. muted again. You're muted again. <laughs> I I think um, uh, I will say you know there are bits and pieces of uh, issues of racism here and there uh, which I I don't think uh, we can hide away from um, it is there it is there but not uh, not too glaring not too glaring uh, but you know much recently uh, what has actually taken it. Uh, Taking up, taking the hype in the media is what uh, that of China and Africa, especially what happened in uh, uh, China during the COVID 19, uh, 19 pandemic era. And again, you know, uh, even within uh, Africa, you know, um, uh, a lot of Chinese companies, it's always there. It's always there, you know. Um, there are a lot of issues. I, I, at least I've seen a couple of uh, cases in court, you know, uh, where Africans are actually maltreated by uh, uh, even the Chinese uh, uh, bosses, you know, in their companies and all that. And so a whole lot of uh, those kind of uh, racist tendencies uh, crop up sometimes and all that. Um, for the United States, I don't think uh, it is really, I've not really seen any, I've not heard of any. And, uh, uh, I think uh, it does not really crop up, you know, in that sense, like it has crop up recently with the Chinese. I don't think I've heard any of, uh, uh, with regards to the United States. But, you know, uh, I wouldn't uh, just rule it out anyway. I think maybe it is some uh, there, but you know, I can't be categorical. Okay, Th thank you, Ethan. Uh, Mandira or Beatrice, would you like to take that on? Um, 
I'm in the kind of the, the same boat as FM here. Uh, I, you definitely, you know, there, there are, there are incidents and cases that have been reported and do come into the media. But I think that especially uh, speaking to the, the Guangzhou um, incident uh, during the early stages of COVID, and I think the way, you know, the African countries reacted and especially the leaders in, I think it was Nigeria, if I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it, it kind of showed that, you know, at least at the, at the leadership level, you know, Africa is not, is not going to kind of succumb to this colonial kind of mistreatment or whether Africans are in China or whether, you know, the Chinese are in Africa treating Africans not, not well. So I think at a leadership level, at least, um, the fact that, you know, African countries were very quick to denounce what happened in Guangzhou, it showed that, you know, you can't just kind of push us around, so to speak. Again, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and you, you still, whether you have to engage fairly, and I, I think I, I really applauded the, the kind of the response to the Guangzhou incident. Um, in terms of uh, US... Mandera, Mandera, why don't you say a little bit more about the Guangzhou incident? Because some of our listeners might not be familiar with it. Oh, that. sure. So... Um, in brief. <laughs> in briefly, um, the, it kind of turned into kind of a, a xenophobic uh, kind of incident. So Guangzhou, there's quite a, a large African community that lives in Guangzhou and um, the, when COVID broke out, they were kind of, uh, they were being mistreated by, by Chinese people and, uh, you know, the landlords even wouldn't let them, let African people come back into their apartments and things because they were accusing them of uh, carrying the virus and spreading the virus and um, all of that. So it, it, it did turn into quite a racist and xenophobic issue. Um, but on the Chinese side as well, they were also responded that that they denounced that treatment and um, you know the African African countries and especially Nigeria is very vocal and I mean they even brought in the, the the Chinese ambassador to Nigeria to have discussions about it and so it it, um, it, it just it turned into quite a I guess it was a, a based on ignorance fueling these kind of the mistreatment of, of African people in Guangzhou, but the response was very robust and very, uh, very, uh, you know, forthright in terms of how African countries responded to being, to seeing African citizens treated quite uh, badly in China. Um, but since that incident, I have not come across or heard much uh, about, um, you know, the mistreatment of, of um, uh, uh, African people in, in China. So um, I don't know if FM or Beatrice have anything else related to COVID-19, Africa, yeah. China yeah. situation. Thank you. Beatrice, anything? Yeah, um, I, I just really want to say uh, sometimes speaking the same language helps a lot. Uh, I mean, I have met so many investors who maybe come from a country that originally speaks English and come in to work in East Africa and most East Africans speak English. So it becomes pretty very easy in terms of the relationship and how, you know, they are able to carry their business. It becomes a little bit very diffi difficult in that different terrain when you have a Chinese investor that, is, that does not speak English or maybe there are a level of uh, English that they speak is very limited. Um, so in terms of expression and in terms of communication and in terms of uh, um, kind of uh, challenges or confrontations that could actually arise from this kind of conversations, uh, we, we have seen this uh, you know, happen uh, because of misunderstanding in terms of the communication. But also there is um, issues around cultural distance. Um, it is true that most Africans have related with the US over very many periods of time, a long period of time. It is not the same that would speak about, you know, um, our friends from, from China. Uh, maybe uh, sometimes you find that 
um, the two societies are getting to familiarize with each other or getting to, you know, to understand each other. I have had examples of, you know, investments, Chinese investments that were done in rural areas in Africa. And for the African people, if there is a, a company in that area, that company belongs to us, all of us as the, uh, the society. We are very communal in nature. Now, this is not the same for that investor who comes in from, you know, I mean, maybe China and you come over and everybody expects that they need to benefit uh, from what you are doing in your in your organization. So there is, you know, cultural distances and, you know, um, aspects that sometimes would actually lead to this kind of, you know, misunderstandings, uh, not to also say that, you know, labor issues, I mean, um, uh, I come from Kenya and, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, um, aspects of ILO, international labor organizations that we signed to as Kenya, is very different from China. So if that investor then didn't understand this very well, um, could actually lead and has, of course, led to very ugly, you know, scenarios. Um, so for me, I think there is, you know, more opportunity to get to understand each other more and, you know, to really, you know, get to understand the other person's uh, perspective. It may not purely be racism, as we may see it, but it could actually uh, be propagated or precipitated by other um, bigger or deeper seated aspects. Thank you. Thank you. We are really coming to the end. So I'm gonna have a, a lightning round. And uh, so very brief remarks, but there are so many questions and so many good topics. And one of them I can't, I can't not address and that's the issue of climate change and the different differing perspectives of China, whereas the United States uh, approach, at least of the current administration is, you know, no more investments in fossil fuels. And China on the other hand has a huge uh, need for fossil energy. And um, Africa is sometimes in, in the middle of this. And of course, Africa, as we know, has the second largest rainforest in the world, and uh, which is, you know, fears that it's being depleted and has implications not only for Africa, but for the globe. So again, we have uh, in 30 seconds, if you can, I'd like each of you to comment on this. Um, and uh, Beatrice, you're up on my screen, so why don't you start? <laughs> okay, I, I, I go for it. Um, it is true that, you know, for most countries that have industrialized, there has been quite a high reliance on uh, fossil fuels, not to say that um, uh, that is the nature and the direction that uh, we all should take. It is true that, um, you know, China over the years has relied on coal uh, in, in terms of the, you know, production and manufacturing, but it is also true that they have uh, already uh, taken up, you know, very um, innovative, uh, you know, use of green energy uh, in terms of also the commitments that they have done with the Paris Agreement are, you know, the zero emissions by, I think, 2060, if I am not uh, wrong. Um, so you can actually see China as a developing country is really, in my view, setting a good pace, you know, for other developing countries in terms of what is possible. I mean, there is the journey of where have you come from, but also what is possible in terms of, you know, going forward. And where I come from in East Africa, there's been, of course, a lot of conversations around renewable energy. We all know it is very, very difficult to industrialize, you know, to manufacture heavy manufacturing through um, renewable energy, because if we look at our energy mix, the percentage of renewable energy is still, you know, very low. Uh, the higher percentage for us has uh, always come from, uh, you know, uh, hydroelectric. Uh, but then the question is, what kind of uh, uh, development path are we adopting? Do we really just want to look at manufacturing all only, or is service-oriented uh, kind of development an option? And for for me, coming from from Kenya digital technology and uh, use of technology, FinTech is really been a focus area uh, in terms of our developmental path, but also the service industry around uh, you know, tourism so that we're not just only manufacturing reliance and therefore 
um, leading us to require quite a lot of heavy use of fossil fuels for development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ethan, any comments on that? Not really, um, I, but I, I, I think China is doing well with regards to uh, climate change and um, uh, anyway, in their own country, but um, I don't know, I think um, what they are doing in Africa right now, but, but I guess, you know, I think uh, it depends on the, the laws governing each country, you know, with regards to climate change and environmental uh, protection and all that, I think, uh, um, you know, uh, part of the problem is African countries being able to enforce these laws, you know, and being able to make sure that China uh, companies, Chinese companies or Chinese citizens who are in Africa do not breach these laws and all that. I think it's, it's all about us. They, they, they are not going to help us protect our, our environment. They are not going to help, uh, help us uh, 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 fight for fight against pollution. It is we Africans that have to do that. And uh, I guess a lot of countries are actually uh, putting in place laws and uh, 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 regulations that will prohibit uh, uh, pollution, uh, destruction of the environment, uh, uh, protection of uh, our forests, and all that. You know, Africa still has one of the uh, uh, existing uh, uh, richest forests and. Um, and so, but uh, I think uh, not to say too much, uh, uh, protecting the environment, you know, fighting climate change is about the government of African countries. It's not about China. China will not come and tell you they want to help you protect the environment. All they know they're looking for is their interest. If they're coming here to get resources, say they're coming to get timber, they have to get timber except you tell them that you don't want to sell timber anymore. You want to protect your forest. And so I think it's about us. It's about us protecting our environment. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Evan. Man Mandiri, you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. I'll try and make it quick. Uh, so I think, you know, the Chinese have learned a lot from their development and the impacts it has on, uh, has on uh, their natural environment. And you can see that they, they are, uh, you know, quite becoming quite um, cognizant of really, uh, at least internationally, getting really involved in uh, environmental uh, kind of programs and things. And in Africa, they one of, I think, I stand corrected, but they are really quite big in solar and solar energy and developing solar panels and things like that. And even the Belt and Road Initiative, you have now this initiative called Greening the Belt and Road Initiative. And I 100% agree with FM that, you know, at the end of the day, countries coming to Africa are always, you know, they, they here to kind of uh, meet their own interests and carry out their own interests. And it's really up to Africans to, to take the responsibility to protect the environment, do what's right, um, for climate change. And I don't think that pointing the finger and like saying China's doing this and China's doing that badly and China's damaging this. And, you know, I think it's African countries and African leaders need to really, as FM said, take responsibility and for, for uh, kind of implementing laws, upholding environmental laws and protecting the environments. So uh, that was it in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. And um, before I, I sign off, I will um, turn uh, to Ambassador Ray to see if he has any final remarks. Uh, we are two minutes over, but um, Ambassador Ray, I'd like to, you know, hear your two cents on this. I will, I will try to be quick. Uh, I, I, I am very, very heartened to see again that we have more interest than we have time, and I look forward to to a, a, uh, an encore of this. I would just say that, that one of the words that's been mentioned several times during this, this uh, symposium that I think is very important that we should all keep in mind is this idea of cooperation and partnership, uh, and particularly in regards to climate change. While I certainly agree that it is the countries of Africa who must take control of their own destiny and protect their environment, 
because climate change affects the habitability of the entire globe, we all, China, the US, the African countries and everyone need to partner together to address this and other issues. And, and I certainly hope that everyone listening picked up on the fact that our panelists have, have throughout talked about the need for partnering and for working together in cooperation rather than uh, unproductive competition. And, and with that, I thank uh, FPRI and, and its members for hosting this, uh, this center, the Africa Center for the Study of the U.S. for participating. And I look forward to us all getting together again sometime soon to continue this discussion. And thank you, President Flynn, for all your support. Thank you. And thank, thanks to our panelists and the African Center for the Steady United States. Definitely, we will want to do more with you. This has been an extraordinary com conversation and a lot of not only knowledge, but wisdom dispensed. So thank you to our attendees today. We hope to see you again. And don't forget the conversation with Ambassador uh, Ryan Crocker coming up on September 9th. That, that stands to be a very, very interesting conversation. So uh, to our our uh, audience at home, I, we wish you all the best, a, you know, a safe, uh, stay well throughout these trying times, and we shall see you again here. Take care. <laughs>